You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Hi, I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser, and welcome back to NCR 525, which is our course on mediation. Today we are going to devote the entire episode to speaking with a friend of mine, Julia Chavez, about her experience as a, a practitioner in mediation. Uh, she works in the court system, or has worked in the court system. She also works in youth systems. So um, I'd like to just start the show by welcoming her. Welcome, Julia, to our show. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's fun to have you here. Um, today we're going to talk about um, some of your experiences, which are different from mine and uh, try to learn a little bit more about the mediation process uh, from your perspective. So I'll start with what is your background and training regarding mediation? Well, I did my training at Cal State Long Beach. And after that, I did an internship with uh, OC Human Relations, where I did mediation in the court system mm -hmm. and over the phone as well to do intake calls okay. in order to you know, go to the mediation. And did you do mediation over the phone? No, I, have, I didn't do mediation over the phone, but I would do calls, like I guess in the caucus format in that sense, mm -hmm. where I would call one person and ask them what they would like to re uh, receive out of the mediation and mm -hmm. go back and forth and then see if they would want to do the actual mediation. Right, and what was that experience like on doing intake? It was a long process because I had to you know, grab my notes and then call one person and one call could take like 15 to 30 minutes, mm -hmm. and then immediately call someone back, mm -hmm. 15, 30 minutes. So sometimes it would be like an hour and a half on the phone for one case, and sometimes I would have like three or four cases. And that's to get them to the to point. Uh, to go to schedule mediation. <laughs> right, right. Yes. And that would be to schedule with the agency, right? Yes, with the agency. Okay, and what kind of cases would that typically involve, would you say? It would be neighbor to neighbor. Okay. Most of the time, the cases. So I always see those in civil harassment. So mm -hmm. this is uh, prior to getting there. Yes, prior. Which would be a good thing, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And were those mostly referrals by the police, or would you say they were referrals from other sources? It would be from the police. Yeah? Yeah. Where they hand out the card. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so something that uh, uh, some practitioners don't realize is that police officers carry uh, cards for different agencies mm -hmm. to help people resolve their disputes. So you can't call the police. I guess you can call the police yeah. uh, 15 times mm -hmm. about the barking dog, but at some point the police suggest that you do something else, right? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Uh, so you said you interned. Yes. Um, and you did that in the offices and the courts, yes. uh, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, why? What was your motivation for, for doing after that? after I finished the course in mediation, I actually wanted to be hands-on. Mm -hmm. And one thing is to learn it from a book and your professor, and then another one is to actually go in the courts and learn new terminology and actually see how people react. Mm -hmm. To anything. So. Yeah, and I, um, you know, my, my bias is definitely as a practitioner mm -hmm. that sort of like the notion of swimming, that if we talk about how to swim standing on the pool deck, we don't really know if we can swim until we get in that pool. Um, so, I, of course, I share your point of view on that one. Um, what did you think when you got there? It, <clears throat> like, what was your first day like, for example? My first day, it was a little nerve wracking because yeah, you're there pretty much the whole day. So you're there early in the morning, and then you have to wait until the courtroom opens. But before that, you have to go into the mediation office, sign in, you know, do all the orientation. Mm -hmm. And then you walk in, and it's so different from the courts on the TV. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very different. Um, no one is yelling. No one is um, talking back to the judge. Well, there is talking back to the judge, but that usually stops right away. Yeah, because they yeah. get in trouble with the judge. Yeah, sure. they get in trouble with the judge. And then you learn the terminology, like... What's the difference between continuing a case and um, the contested and uncontested cases? Dismissed without prejudice, prejudice with, with prejudice. prejudice. Yeah, oh. right. Yeah. Um, so, what was so? What is that like? Did you feel intimidated? Did you feel excited? Did you feel something else? I was excited, but I was just wondering how the people's reaction were going to be to to me because most of the mediators mm. there are older. Okay. And I was like the only 20-year-old, and everyone else is like in their 30s or 40s mm -hmm. or even older. 
So that was my worry that I was going to be yeah. taken seriously. Yeah. So what was the reaction when you when you got going? Mm -hmm. You know, after some time, did you feel a bias given your younger age? Um, I did because they would ask me, "Are you sure? Did you write that down?" They were like, "Really?" Reassure, trying to reassure themselves that I was doing what I was supposed to do, and I told them, "Yes." I know what you asked me three minutes ago. Huh. I can tell you what. So they what would have did. you write, they would make sure you were writing Yeah, they're it down? like, oh, yeah, you got that down, right? That it was this amount of money. I'm like, of course, if it's a company. <laughs> right. Yes. You're mediating. Yes, I'm mediating. Of course, I'm going right. to write down how much the total cost is going to be. And they're like, can you please do it in a calculator? I was like, okay. Huh. <laughs> so that's interesting. Yeah. So, so did you lose that over time? Or is that, would you say that's still a. I, I did factor. I feel like I did lose it over time, like about what I'm doing, because mm -hmm. um, I would just bring everything with me, so they would see that um, I wouldn't have to go up and get a calculator from across the room. I would already have it with me, either like next to me or on the table, depending on where we're mediating. So it's sort yeah. of like you you brought the tools so that they would feel better about yeah. you. Exactly. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Yeah. So it's like they already have trouble. They just don't mm -hmm. realize they're the ones that actually yeah are the ones we should be doubting. <laughs> right especially when they come and tell me like one they tell me one thing like one part of the story uh -huh. and they're like oh wait that didn't happen and so they want me to know what actually happened hmm. so I have to like then I have to reread everything I've wrote, written down for them mm -hmm. and they're like oh but that's wrong I'm like but that's what you said right so, which I have had that experience yeah. where they say I didn't say that or that isn't what I think mm -hmm. and you have no reason to have written down something that wasn't what they said you don't know them yeah but they don't have that clarity, right? Yeah. So um, let's talk about, you said about being young, people looked at you a certain way. Did you have that also um, as a woman? Yes, I did. Okay. Especially when I, when my co-meter was a, was a man. Mm. They would, I actually had one time a, a man tell me because he was the lead mediator. It was mm -hmm. one of my first times mediating and he left to go do a caucus. So it was just me and the, um, one of the other parties, mm -hmm. and, and then he looked at me, he's like, oh, you could actually learn a thing or two from him. Oh. And so what did you say? I Nothing? just said, there is a lot of learn in mediation. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. But I, I could feel him looking down on me, because he was doing most of the talking, but that usually happens with the lead mediator. I just, like, add questions, like when there's a, a space when no one is talking. Right. I ask questions, something similar or different, depending on my mm -hmm. perspective perception of the problem that's going on. Right. So um, the lead mediator chose to not have you go to the caucus, which is kind of unusual. No, no. He went to go bring the other person in. Oh, okay. Like switching. Oh, so it wasn't yeah. even really... Okay. It was in between the caucus before bringing... Right. Them. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're caucusing in the room. Got yeah. it. Um, that's interesting to me. Uh, so how do you manage a co-mediator when that perception's happening? Right. What like what do you do? I, you said you'd ask questions mm -hmm. when there was an opening. Like, is there a way to repair that, or do you live with it? Like, I just continued doing what I was doing because I ha I knew I was not doing anything wrong. Right. I was like, because he was taking the lead, and I was letting him. He had more knowledge in landlord tenant, mm. so I was letting him speak more. And I, and then whenever I there was needing clarification for anyone, I would go in and like ask a clarifying question. And that, that yeah. for me, I, I always feel like specialty knowledge mm -hmm. in the court you're serving is kind of a good news, bad news mm -hmm. scenario. Because like on one level, you give fresh eyes to the situation. Mm -hmm. So you can ask a question because you don't understand maybe the law behind the particular matter they're speaking about. And then you have on the flip side of that, you have sort of this other uh, knowledge the mediator might know. And then they might be biased because of it, right? Yeah. Which I know, I'm sure you've seen. I can't imagine. I, I haven't asked you that, but I, yeah. I'm sure you've seen the bias. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing about um, uh, about the biases being a, a woman or younger. Have you had it in terms of ethnic background? Ethnic background, I haven't. No, had that yet. Okay, I'm not suggesting it's a good thing. No, I saying. yeah, I, yeah. I just I know that will happen. Yeah, um, I've certainly had it as a woman. I think because I'm older, then I get probably the perception that maybe I'm know what I'm doing, whether I do or not, you know, which is kind of interesting how people make their choices, uh, especially given the, the, the population we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So here's a population who's already can't work out their own issues, and then they're making snap judgments about us, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. We're the ones with the training, so. Yes, and then they think we're lawyers. 
Yeah. No, we're not. Right, <laughs> right. Well, that badge, you know, yeah. the badge is everything, right? Mm -hmm. So and we're in a suit, so. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I say to, yeah. to, actually, to younger mediators. I do mm -hmm. say, you know, wear a wear a coat and, and wear some attire that makes it look, like, try to add five years, you know, yeah. if you can. But I guess people make their judgments. Um, so what So what have you learned about the court system and about mediation from the in, in the courthouse uh, mm -hmm. situation? So I've learned the etiquette, so how you're supposed to react, very respectful. Mm -hmm. And even if they're not being respectful to you, you have to bite your tongue and not let your emotions mm -hmm. get to you. Mm -hmm. That that's really important. And because one little movement, little eye gesture, whatever, mm -hmm. a facial movement, they know that they upset you and then they're going to take advantage of that. Anyway. Right. So if someone's being disrespectful toward you, like mm -hmm. what? What would you recommend a mediator do in that case? I've certainly experienced yeah. it, but I'm curious what, what you would do. Well, I've done is smile and nod, or just ignore it and continue with another question mm -hmm. from what's going on in the, in the mediation. I find that some people will continue on, even if I leave it on the floor, mm -hmm. like so to speak, or if I, I don't acknowledge mm -hmm. like their rudeness or their you know, bringing mm -hmm. up issues over and over. Um, and I find that they, they still sometimes won't let it go. You know, I don't know, what, do you have that same experience? For me, um, I think they're just shocked that, because I am younger, that I did not make a reaction. I think yeah. they think I, I have a shorter fuse just because I'm younger. I can't control my emotions. Right. So they're more like bombarded. And then when I go, just continue on, mm -hmm. they're just like, oh, okay, I'll answer your question. Right. Yeah, yeah that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I had a case um, a couple of weeks ago um, that involved a, uh, mother of some children and the new girlfriend, mm -hmm. right? We've you've seen that before, I'm sure, in civil, very common case. And uh, the, they both, we kept them separate in a caucus, and every time we got together with them, they would bring up when the affair happened, whether it was before they and, you know, were divorced or not. And the one who was the ex-wife said it was during when they were married, you know, and they kept bringing it up, kept mm -hmm. bringing it up. And I, I almost said at one point, hey, so, that doesn't have a, it didn't have anything to do mm -hmm. with they, there was harassment behavior between them and um, that was really our subject of our mediation but it's so interesting when people want to get in there and kind of you know use it as a way to kind of I don't know get an alliance or try to get a reaction yeah. I don't know so we we left it on the floor the whole yeah. time but it probably got brought up eight times maybe back mm -hmm. and forth back and forth we kept hearing it um, and the thing was is for some reason they felt that was like something they wanted to say. And I, I think for me, that I, what I kept thinking about, and I'll get your opinion on it too, but it seemed like an identity issue. Like I, the, the new girlfriend said, I, we did not have the affair mm -hmm. when they were married. That seemed like I'm not that kind of person. And then the, the woman was like, they did it. They did this thing to me. See how I'm the good person and I'm a victim. And it was like this very big staging. I don't know. Have you experienced that kind of thing in court? Yeah, I have. Um, especially when it comes to Latino culture, since I'm oh. Latina, they're like, oh, we're Latinos, we need to stick together, we need uh -huh. to help our, better our people. Uh -huh. I'm like, yeah. Which, I, is, which is true. It is true, but not in this case. In this case, I'm right. neutral. Right. I'm just here to help both of you. Yeah, uh, so how do you stay neutral? In, when how you, I stay neutral? When they play that card, that's when a they tough play, one. When they play that card, I just let it be okay. until it quiets down, because sometimes they keep like, until they want you to say yes, I agree with you, and I just uh -huh. say, oh, I hear what you're saying. Uh -huh. I understand why you would say that. And then... Oh, I like that one. Yeah. I understand why you would say that. Yeah. I usually say, I hear you. Mm -hmm. So when I say that, and then they kind of calm down. Uh -huh. I'm not really confirming, like, what they're saying, but I guess they just feel heard. Uh -huh. So then I just continue going on with the mediation. And if they keep bringing it up, I say, there's no there's no need to bring up this, this part of us. This is separate uh -huh. from... The issue involved and then right yeah that's an interesting one i've had that you know we're both women or the other day in court one of my one of my mediation interns said they they uh, the disputant turned to him and said you have a mother don't you and he was trying to use this as a, a, a way to try to get some alliance with them. And, I, and he came afterwards and said i think almost everybody has a mother i mean not necessarily living but you know, that they acknowledge, and so it was kind of a funny, like it was a desperate plea to yeah. try to get this connection. Any little thing, they'll try to yeah. make a connection with you to get you on their side. They're like, I want the better deal. 
Right. Right. And so what's interesting about that is this, how we started this conversation talking about swimming and talking about getting, you know, your motivation to go into mm -hmm. the court and, and do it. Um, this is precisely what isn't in a book. No. It seems like. They don't tell you, oh, this person's going to try to persuade you this way in different ways they can do it. Or they'll just use the quiet card. I actually had one person just to make the perception that they're shy and they're taking advantage of. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I need you to speak. Mm. I need your side of the story. Right. Obviously, this person, Right. there's two people here, two sides to the story. I'm not going to just listen to one side because then it's not neutral or fair. Right. And so then we have to, as mediators, manage that, which I find hard, actually, sometimes when people don't want to elaborate. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do you think about that? I asked, I usually ask a, the question a couple times differently mm. to see if they'll realize I'm asking the same thing. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. And then they elaborate, but sometimes they just won't budge. And mm -hmm. when that happens, I just take a break or a caucus. Mm hmm yeah. And then just try to get it in mm -hmm. a new format. Yeah. yeah. I always think to myself, if they really watched me, like in a movie format, they'd see that I'm asking the same question over mm -hmm. and over, maybe in a different context or a different phrasing. Yeah. But it's sort of like, you won't answer that? Okay, let me rephrase it exactly how I phrased it before, but just with a special couple new words, you know, which is kind of an, an interesting thing. Um, so what, what would you say you've taken away in terms of watching mediations and certainly watching other mediators? What would you say you've learned about mediation generally? There's different ways to mediate. Every mediator has their, has their own thing. In the book, it tells you, okay, this is how you're supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. But when you get there, you won't follow the steps on how it's supposed to be. Okay. Because they ever want to stay in one stage, or they just want to move forward to another stage without doing the ones in the middle. Okay. And that, that's difficult when they just want to say, oh, I want my money. Oh, Give the, me my the money. disputants, you Yeah, saying. the disputants. Okay. So you've learned that as, as, I guess what I hear you saying is that the stages are the stages, but that disputants try to push us out of those stages? Is that? Yes. Yeah. And that, they don't tell you that in the books. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. And I find they flip me back and forth. So they'll say, here's what I want. I want $500, mm -hmm. but let me tell you why. And I'm like, wow, I was in stage four, and now I'm back at two. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm kind of everywhere. Yeah. What would you, do you think it's important to go in order in the stages? Like, do you have thoughts about that? I mean, it's a good guideline because mm -hmm. you have to go with what, how they're, what, what they're communicating. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you can skip steps if they're already on the same page. Mm -hmm. You can go all the way to writing the stipulation. Right. And then you're like, when you rephrase anything, you could go back to the storytelling mm -hmm. and say, oh no, let me tell you why I don't want that yeah. anymore. Yeah. And then you just get new information. So I think right. normally you go back and forth. It's not just a stage one to five. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I hardly ever get cases that are already to the stipulation. Do you, mm -hmm. Have you had those before? Yes, I have. Those are. Um, tell us. Tell us about what that is. Oh, the stipulation is where we write the agreement with everyone. Oh no, I didn't mean that. I meant. Oh. Um, I meant. <laughs> tell us about the what that's like when they've oh. already formed kind of their decision in the hallway, oh, so to speak, or, or wherever they decided that. So when that happens, it's just you do like the legality part, what is mediation, and then they go, okay, so this person owes me $500, I want it, whatever, like three, I want 100 this week, 100 another, mm -hmm. and they'll be done in like three weeks. Mm -hmm. So that one's really easy, they just write it down, you're there, right. write it up, and they're gone in like 10 minutes. So, um, so they have somehow figured out mm -hmm. this payment and maybe even the plan. Yes. And then you're just doing the final execution to make it official, so yes. to speak. Okay. And so, um, yeah, I hardly ever get those. I feel like I get the opposite. I get the worst case, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's the court coordinator, uh, helping me yeah. out, you know, which, you know, the court coordinator, yeah. um, but uh, tell us about that role as the, as the coordinator. What's that like? And um, what are your thoughts about the, that role in court? I guess the perception that you have is that it's an easy job, that they're just there punching in numbers. But really, they're doing work before court even starts. Okay. They have to get all the court cases ready, all the case notes beforehand, mm -hmm. and read it, and then think about who's actually coming in as a mediator to help. Mm -hmm. And then you go in, and then you have to check like the boxes, okay, which ones can go to mediation, the contested cases. Right. And then you have to sort them out. And then, you know, think about the mediator's personality and the way they work with people. And then you give out the cases. 
Right, and you have acted as the court coordinator before when I have been a mediator. Yes. So the tables turned entirely. Um, what What is your decision making thinking behind assigning a mediator to a mm -hmm. case or not? First, I, I think I even offered to have us do it together, and you said no, you can do it on your own, yeah. <laughs> which I is pretty great. Well, I looked at it because that's how um, the actual court co coordinator did it, mm. and I feel you learn more that way. Mm -hmm. You look at you look at what you're writing, and let's say, okay, maybe I could change this phrasing, mm -hmm. or you edit it first, and then when it gets the final product, there's less mistakes to go back and forth, and you save time, mm -hmm. so you could get to your next case. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so what's your favorite context to mediate? What, what court is your favorite and why? Well, I, I like all of them, but... That's my, not an answer. No, I, I do like all of them because <laughs> they all have, they're all pretty much similar. You know, they, you think yeah. that just in small claims, it's just about money. There mm -hmm. should be no emotions. There's a lot of emotions, no matter <laughs> there what. There should be no emotions. There shouldn't, there's just like, okay, I owe money. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pay you this or I won't pay you this. Mm -hmm. But it's like they cry, oh, I can't mm -hmm. pay this. Or they're like, oh, you're not giving me a, a good rate. And then right. there, there's a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. But then there's also um, civil harassment, mm -hmm. which is like pretty much pure emotion. Right. The good and the bad. Right. And, and not, a prior relationship. Yes, a prior relationship. Most often. Mm -hmm. not, not entirely, but very often. Yeah, and that one, I, for civil harassment, I feel that it is the hardest one. Yes, I think the same thing. And that's why I like it. It's, it's more of a puzzle to mm -hmm. put together so, you know, the picture of what they want will come out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of interesting because um, what I hear you saying is you like the challenge. Uh, but you still have the emotions in civil mm -hmm. harassment, right? You yeah. have the same just over something else. Yeah. Maybe not over money. Mm -hmm. Different right? things, yeah. Or, well, I guess frustration would be common between the two in terms of emotion. Um, so your favorite is civil? Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. It's If I asked you that two years ago, I don't think you would have said that. I would have been, oh, I'm scared. I don't want to do that. I just want to do small claims. <laughs> it's just money. Well, how hard is that going to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As said every famous mediator, how hard is that going to be? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, that's kind of an interesting part. I mean, I do think it is easier to, to mediate a small claims case, but sometimes they're not easy, though. Right? When you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so let's, um, we talked about the role of the court coordinator. Um, you have to give a speech in uh, small claims as a court coordinator. Um, tell us about what that is and tell us about what it does. So after roll call, just to see who's in the court. So most of the people that go into court don't know what mediation, so that was the speech for. Mm -hmm. To inform everyone in the audience what mediation and the pros and cons of mediation mm -hmm. and why they would they consider it or not consider it. Right. So that's basically what the speech is there for. Right. And then um, from my experience, people listen to that speech and sort of understand it. Is yeah. that what you'd say? Yes, because then they come and it's like, oh, I didn't understand this part of what you said. Can you explain what it is? Mm -hmm. And then some people just don't listen. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, what is mediation? Right. And you go up to them and then mm -hmm. they say... Or I find my experience is I, I say, do you know what mediation is? And they say, yes. And then they say, what is it again? <laughs> they confuse. <me. laughs> you know, I'll say, do you know what mediation is? And they'll say, yeah. But, you know, you can tell me. Or I tell them and they say they know. And then when we get there, they say, what do we do? And I just had told them that maybe earlier. But I think, wouldn't you say people are generally freaked out in court? Yeah. I mean, generally kind of nervous and unsettled. Mm -hmm. Nervous. And sometimes, sometimes unprepared, thinking that they either are nervous or they think they have it and they're going to win. Oh yeah, that's a that's a yeah. problem. Yeah. So unprepared is a good comment. Mm -hmm. I, it's something we haven't talked about much um, on in this particular class. Mm -hmm. um, would you say people are mostly prepared? Not mostly prepared. Um, I feel like there's three. Some that are overly prepared. They bring every single <laughs> paper dealing with the case, and they sounds don't even, like landlord tenant. To yeah, me. and they I feel even, like that is always that. Let me give you every receipt mm -hmm. we've ever had on the property. Oh yeah, here's a contract. Read it, and I don't even know where any of the sections are. And then they get mm -hmm. frustrated. Mm -hmm. It's right there. Right. Well, I didn't know it was on page five, and I'm like on page seven. <laughs> right. Right. And then there's the people who nothing, not even a pen. It's just the, themselves walking in. And the attire too. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't know how to dress for the court. Some people right. are wearing sandals and shorts and a t-shirt. Right. And some are wearing like slacks and a dress shirt. 
Right. So that you see the difference. Yeah, which is kind of interesting. Just And it probably reflects in the preparation at times where people think, oh, this is just not a big deal. Um, I don't think you know this story that I had. Um, I, I think two months ago I had a civil harassment case and we were caucusing and um, I had the, the one um, defendant or respondent, right, in that case was sitting outside and I said, I'll be back in five minutes to get you. Stay right here. And she left and ran an, ran an errand. Oh, no, I didn't know. So, well, <laughs> so what, that was kind of interesting for me. So mm -hmm. I was caucusing. So I do the caucus with the other, uh, the petitioner. And then I said, okay, let's go back out and I'll have you. And they were sitting in separate locations because they had a, a problem being in the same room. And so I had them, and then I went back to this location and she was not there. And so I went through all the courtrooms and you know how it changes yeah. sometimes the courtroom. So I went through all N18 and two, like all these mm -hmm. different places. And then I went through all the restrooms and I couldn't find her. And then like 30 minutes later, she said, yeah, I had some things I had to do. And I'm like, okay, well we had, you know, we're doing court. And so she shows back up at five to 12 and wants to have a, um, a, an agreement written up. And I said, we're, we're going to have to go into the afternoon session, which she didn't like. And I, I thought to myself, I don't know if you even understand like how important it is that you're in court right now. Like, do you understand how serious this is? Which is kind of interesting when you say shorts and sandals. That's what mm -hmm. made me think of it. Yeah. It's like you would need to bring the contract and you would need to bring the receipt. Um, how often do you feel like people aren't prepared, would you say? I find that a lot. And you can tell like by... Like more than 50%? Yeah, like 60%. Because they're like, oh, I'm missing this document. Can I just go run home really quick and go grab yeah, it? Yeah, which I've been asked a bunch yeah. of times. And, it's and like, what do you say to them? No, you can't. You're doing this mediation. <laughs> right. And, you ha and then you're going to go back to court, and you have to give the judge all the evidence you have. And if you don't have it, oh, well. Right. I remember one mediator um, used to always say in the office, today is the day. So mm -hmm. he would say that, like, today is the day. Mm -hmm. So you either have the, the receipt or you don't, or you the contract or whatever it is. Um, and I find the same, I would say, about 60% or 50%, mm -hmm. something like that, aren't uh, prepared with the documents or they don't have necessarily the right thing. Mm -hmm. Like they might have something unusual, like a video or text messages, but they don't have the actual contract. Uh, yes. And I find that to be curious. I also too, they say, oh, I have an estimate. And then I say, well, was, what did you actually pay for the service? Yeah. Oh, it was like ten dollars more. I'm like, but do you have the receipt of what you paid? Right. No, I just have the estimate, and it's like that's an important thing you need to give to the judge when dealing with money. Right. He like, needs to calculate right. how much he wants to give. Right. Like actually paid mm -hmm. versus yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, and people are interesting with that evidence, believing that's the same. Yes. They they think just because it's a document that all documents are the same and it's going to help me no matter what. Mm -hmm. I Sometimes I see them with like folders and binders oh, yeah. and pictures. And I'm like, do you have everything in order? Because once he asks you for something, you don't know where it is and give it to him. Right. And then they're like, oh, yeah, it's somewhere in here. But it's, it's the difference in knowing and somewhere right. in there. And you're, you're um, reminding me of how many days we've seen individuals in front of the judge with papers everywhere mm -hmm. where they can't find, they have a, a lot of paper, but maybe not, can't find the paper. And it's the important paper that they need. Right, <laughs> so the judge says, do you have this paper? And they go, yeah, absolutely. And I see them just with 50 choices out there and maybe not finding even the one that matters, um, which I, you know, I think you know my famous phrasing, which is, if I were to read all the papers, what would I learn from all those papers? And sometimes they summarize it pretty simply for me, you know, so then I don't have to read them all. And then other times I had a guy one time hand me a 21 page document and I kind of looked it over and asked him what, you know, what would I know from reading this? And he said, look at page seven. I can't believe you don't know what's on page seven. Read page seven right now. And I said, well, I can read it. What would it tell me? And he said, you need to, you just looked it over. You should know it. And I'm like, how would I possibly know a 21 page, you know, it was like three minutes in, you know, I'm like, I don't know what's on page seven. I'm just kind of looking at it. I've never seen any of this. So I don't know what, what kind of um, ideas like that have happened for you? Oh yeah. I had or situations. Uh, no, I, I, I did because then I had, they gave me, um, it was like a calendar, but it wasn't a normal calendar. It was more like by the day basis. And it was 20 pages. They're like, okay, and the ones that are high, there was like different highlighter colors and whatever's highlighted in blue, I, those are the days this person was there. 
and I need you to add up the hours of how they were there, and this is what happened, and I'm just like... <laughs> in the um, co color, in coding. Color, color coding, and then the font, and then they were saying, if, oh. if it's italicized, then that means he was there for like three hours. If it's bold, then five, and I was like, oh. Yeah, where's, the, where's the key? <laughs> yeah, it's like there's got to be an easier way to get this information. Um, okay, so let's talk about your bilingual. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't talked yet about what that's like as a mediator, kind of a strength, maybe a weakness. I don't know. What, what do you think um, regarding um, that special skill you have? I think it is a benefit and it's mm -hmm. a strength because sometimes if they don't know, you know, the other language, they'll start talking in that language and then... And we have to tell them, oh, please speak in English since the other party does not speak Spanish or any other language. Mm -hmm. And then it helps you get to know like, if they're plotting against something. Because one time I had this mm. person say, oh, I'm going to hike up the interest now because it upset me and saying it in Spanish. And the person didn't understand. I was, mm. like, I was like, shocked. I was like, no, you can't do that. You can only go what this paper tells me. Mm. It's a certain amount. You can't. Just say, just because they upset you right now, you can't add $20 or more. Right. Oh, so you're saying, so in the mediation, they made a comment in Spanish mm -hmm. about, I'm going to raise up the interest rate yeah. on the loan or whatever mm -hmm. it was. Um, and then you were able to, to catch them. To catch them. and then The bilingual detective. Yeah. And also, um, what also helps is that sometimes they want a translator there, so I would speak English. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask yeah. you about. Because that's what I was thinking with the mm -hmm. weakness. Is it hard to mediate when two languages are going and you know them both. Yeah, it, I think it is just because when I would know how to say it, because uh, the translator is using the formal way. Okay. And most of the time when I'm talking to people or they're talking to me in Spanish in the mediation, it's informal. Okay. So sometimes I have to say it in another way mm. for them to understand. So I have to repeat it again in Spanish to them because they're like, oh, what does that mean? And then I have to explain it again in English to the other to the other party. Okay, so let's let's separate those two systems. So mm -hmm. there's um, let's start with the one where there's a translator mm -hmm. present doing Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, they speak in a formal way, mm -hmm. but you don't correct in Spanish. Oh, I do not. Do right, not because correct. the rule is right that the translator is doing everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you do you explain the story in a different way or ask the question in a way that they will force them into an informal way of speaking or um some sometimes they know because some the translators do talk to the people beforehand mm -hmm. so sometimes they tell me like oh okay this person um this is what they know and they'll let me know in a certain way how it would, how they're going to tell me more informally okay. or formally okay and then that's when i when i say things in english i would do it informally when okay. usually you have to do everything formally. Right. Yeah. Okay, and then there's times, have there been times where there is no translator and you yeah. still mediated in Spanish? Tell us mm -hmm. about that. That one, I feel it's easier for me just because I already know my way of how I translate things mm -hmm. with the, from the documents. And um, so for me, it's easier to explain things mm -hmm. and going back and forth is natu nat nat naturally to me than going with like the, to, the Engli to English to the translator where I feel I have to be formal, but then sometimes change it. Oh, wait, no. I have mm -hmm. to go back to informal. Right. So that's, that has some complexity mm -hmm. to it. Um, just to corroborate your story, I was with the bilingual mediator last week, and he said the same thing you said about the translator changing the meaning mm -hmm. and, and noting that because he's bilingual mm -hmm. and, and stopping it and saying, no, let's, what I mean is this you know, and, and kind of um, using that special skill to, I don't know, monitor every part of the process. Yeah. Because for me, as an English-only speaker, I feel at a disadvantage sometimes. Because it's like it could get very out of control with the translator inserting him or herself, right? Yeah, can. Usually they're really good at not inserting themselves. Yes. But sometimes, like, they add a comment sometimes, and I'm like, why are you commenting on it? You're, all, you're just supposed to say what I'm saying. Right. So that's sometimes frustrating. That doesn't happen yeah. a lot, but sometimes, like I guess, they get they get really buddy buddy with whoever they're translating with. That's yeah, which kind is of kind of an interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand the idea that you're trying to like get their voice across. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, uh, when I'm mediating in one or two languages, sometimes I'll do two. Uh, if I feel like I hear their voice through that medi or through that translator. Um, that's where I feel like we're in a good place, you know, and then there's other times where I'm like, I can't, I can't hear them. Like I don't hear their story, their perspective, you know, so that's, I would say you have kind of a, a nice advantage in that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So I had a, a mediator, or a, a, not a mediator, a translator one time um, in Czechoslovakia, and I may have told you this story before, who would just answer the question back to me without asking the disputant. And I had to stop her and say, hey, I'm asking the disputant. And she said, well, I know what he's going to say. And I was like, that is not translating. And so we had to stop the mediation, of course. But I don't know. I, I feel like you have a superpower in, in being bilingual. Um, and that's our most frequent language, right, mm -hmm. yeah. that we see? It's, um, from what I've noticed in the court, it's Vietnamese, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Spanish. Mm -hmm. That's, those are the languages that are most, and then the ones, and ASL too as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I would say Spanish is the most that I've used. And sometimes mm -hmm. I feel, you know, in a way, I wonder, or actually I'll ask your opinion on this. Um, when you're, because you're bilingual, do you feel a sense of relief having a translator in there so you don't have to do all those jobs? Like, is that a good thing? Well, it depends. Sometimes um, if it's something I'm not familiar with, then I'm glad there's a translator there. Okay, you mean like the case itself? The case itself, depending on like what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And also depends um, what kind of Spanish. Is it Mexican Spanish? Okay. Salvadorian Spanish. Right. That, that's another thing that's harder to do. Right. Because they use slang and then I don't understand or in, in the Spanish that I know it's different. Right. So that's, that's why sometimes it's easier that way because in that, um, the translator will know or, or clarify to what do you mean when you say this. Right, and then you get, you get a little extra knowledge, mm -hmm. fill in yes. a little gap <laughs> there. Um, yeah. We've certainly all done that in cases, right, mm -hmm. where we fake a little bit, like mm -hmm. we ask general questions to try to figure out what, the, what it is they're talking about. I have had that sometimes in the automotive area, mm -hmm. an area that I don't know much about. Um, where I'm not sure what the part does or why we would have it, but we know cars have them. And I know that sounds terribly uh, uneducated, but I, I'm not that educated in automotive. So um, I find myself asking questions. Maybe a translator would be helpful in that process too. So, um, okay, so the big question we always ask everybody, I want to get your opinion. How do you stay neutral as a mediator? Oh, don't let the emotions get to you, their emotions. Okay. Um, they'll, that's how they'll try to persuade you to be on their side. If they're crying, they'll want like some condolence. Mm -hmm. And I just like give them tissue and say, do you need a minute? Mm -hmm. Instead of them, me going, like giving them a hug or like a pat or something. Oh, right. Because yeah. that's what they want. They yeah. want some comfort. I'm like, you, do you need a minute? Mm -hmm. And they say yes or no. Or they mm -hmm. just continue crying even harder right. to get some reaction towards you. So, but how do you do that? I mean, I hear what you're saying. Like yeah. you offer them a way to manage their emotion. But... Yeah. You, yeah, I, that's how I, I uh -huh. deal with it. Let them manage it until they get through it. Okay. So I'm looking at it as not an issue, but a, a, a step in the mediation. Mm, I like it's that. It's a step that you have to go through. So I'm okay. not putting my emotions like, oh, poor lady for crying or yeah. the angry man, like just... Yeah, that's like something. stereotypical. Yeah, yeah, like go, go, go outside, you know, take a walk, take a breather, what you need. Right. And sometimes that does work. Yeah. And sometimes they just storm out and yeah. like, this is at a pause. Yeah. So that's how I say neutral. I just let them deal with it. Yeah. I just help them like just give them a, um, like a tissue. So or... the management would be let me give you a tissue, tissue mm -hmm. or water or a break. Yeah, uh, that's how. Let me give you a space or a tool to help yeah. you. I love the idea that it's a step though. It is because, and that's something that you don't know when you're reading it at the books. Uh huh. They're like, okay, so this person's going to say something, this person's going to say another, and then you're going to go on this step. And yeah. It's like, no, there's going to be a lot of bumps on yeah. the road yeah. before you get there to the right. stipulation. But for me, sometimes I feel like, like you said, step, which I mm -hmm. like, because I feel like, especially in civil harassment, we, if we're mediating together, which doesn't happen mm -hmm. that much in that mm -hmm. court, but um, they need to see it maybe. Right, yeah. the emotion, they need to see like, oh, I'm causing some of this dynamic. And then I also tell them, you also need to calm down when, if this doesn't go through and you don't have a stipulation. When you go to court, you can't just be there crying. The judge wants answers. Right, so that would be a hard thing to say to someone. I personally don't find it hard hmm. just because I'm giving them the tools that they need to succeed in what they need to right. do. And, right. it, and if it hurts them, it's like, 
well, you're in. But you this. told them the truth. Yes. Right. That the crying won't be the reason the judge decides something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or being angry. Angry is probably one I'd say that gets shut down even faster by yes. the judge. Wouldn't you say? Yes, that one. Because for the judge, when someone's crying, or um, like taking a moment, mm -hmm. or feeling a little sick, he like gives them a, like one or two minutes to collect themselves. But if someone's angry and yelling at him. He's like, no, stop right there. I'm the one speaking. You need to wait. Right. Gets very directive. Uh -huh. um, so it doesn't sound like emotion is uh, surprising to you in mediation. No. So what does surprise you? You sound like invincible. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> what takes you off guard? Like, what's the thing that gets you? Like, you go, oh, oh wow. Well, because sometimes you can see how someone is getting emotional, either angry, like, you know, they start raising up their voice or they start, like, breathing really harder. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but when it comes out of nowhere where someone just starts crying, mm -hmm. and from what you, my perspective, I don't think it's sad mm -hmm. or upsetting. Right. And then I'm like, oh. That, that throws right. me off, and I have to take a couple seconds to, like, get myself together and say, okay, what can I do at this moment to help mm -hmm. them? and right. help this process move forward and not to have it at a halt. I find that a lot of mediators that I train will say, oh, as soon as I see the emotion, I got to get out of there, right? Like people mm -hmm. run from it. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about lately around emotion is it's actually the only, uh, or one of the only valid indicators that you're onto something. Yes. Like when they start getting angry or frustrated or sad or whatever the, the emotion is, I find to my, I find myself like, wow, we're, we're close to something. Yeah, you're heading in the right direction. Yeah. Because if there's nothing going on, then they're really not caring about the, they're not really caring about the right. issue. And right. then you can be there forever, but when they start having emotion, then you know which way to go towards mm -hmm. what they need. Mm -hmm. So without the emotion, I feel like the mediation would not happen. Right. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like our valid yeah. our barometer of where we are mm -hmm. in the in the process. Um, do you think overall that mediation is a is a fair process? Like given we're emotional people, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think mediation is fair? I, it depends on the mediator. Mm. I think cuz I feel like the process the process, you know, mediation what it is is fair. Mm -hmm. But depending on the person who's facilitating, that's when you know it's going to be fair or not. Okay. Because you could have one person who is siding with the other side then it's not fair. Okay. And then you have uh, another person who is doubting themselves or doubting what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then how can you be fair if you don't even know what you have going on? Right. In so a lot of it, a lot of the fairness rests with the mediator mm -hmm. um, being skilled and also maybe having intuition or what, what would you say? Yeah, I feel like you have to trust yourself and mm -hmm. the skills you've learned. Mm hmm that they're gonna guide you where you need to go. Mm -hmm. Because if you doubt yourself, I had one time where I doubted myself. Just one time? No, then, no, I, <laughs> Cause I, I keep I, it I, internal. <laughs> if I, I am like, oh, what's good, what I have to do next? But like yeah. in the very beginning, I would doubt myself mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. And I would see myself, I would just be there like silent. And no, you have to fill in those gaps, ask questions and do things to try to move forward. Cause when you get stuck, or you're like confused, oh, this person said something, but they actually meant something else. Mm -hmm. And you're just there. It's not going to help the process. You're just stopping it. Right. So you need to move forward. Right. That. And I, I find that is something that a lot of mediators develop over their first year is this ability to kind of let things roll off your back. Even if you ask like a question mm -hmm. that's not good or, or you, like you said, you misread a nonverbal mm -hmm. or there's something that you're missing, you just go, well... I can't worry about whether I'm okay as a mediator right now. I have to yeah. kind of do this problem. Yeah, because you have to focus on them. Right. Because if you focus too much on yourself, it's like, oh, I didn't ask that right question. Yes. It's like they'll know there's something wrong. They'll know and they'll ask you, oh, is that okay? Yeah. They'll, they'll start trying to reassure you. And um, that's when I feel you need to really get yourself together. Yeah. <laughs> and and do get your skills out, right. out there. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting I, a notion. I really like that idea of saying it's it's an other-centered process mm -hmm. and my focus has to be on other people. And to the extent that I get onto myself, I actually mm -hmm. kind of ruin the process. Um, and I've, I've said that a lot to people I train in public speaking. Mm -hmm. I'll say, you have to focus on your audience and whether they're understanding you 
And if you overthink yourself, then you're going to wonder, like, do am I is my shoulder off? Am I looking weird? Am I? I bet my makeup's wrong, and I bet my zipper's down, and like all these things, and you can get into a weird place, right? And so it's kind of like that idea to say I'm to the extent that I'm my focus is entirely uh, out on them, then I don't I don't do that analysis. Yeah, and it's all about them. You're just there to help, right? You know. They can stop it at any time, and it's not your fault that they stopped. Right, which I think is a hard yeah. thing to get over as a mediator. Um, so you have certainly heard what I've heard in the mediation office, which is uh, people announcing their success rates and different things, saying success is getting a, a stipulation. Yeah, um, I don't agree with that at all. Okay, so tell us, tell us your thought. Because then that's making it about yourself. Yeah. That's not about, it's not about the people involved. That's not what the what a mediator would say, though. They would say, yeah. "I help everybody. It's a win-win, right?" <laughs> well, yeah, because also if they're if as they're a point where they don't want to be helped anymore, mm -hmm. there's only so much you can do, right? Before they're like, "Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Right? I'm leaving," and then they're upset or fine or neutral, whatever they're feeling at that moment. Mm -hmm. So, I feel like just because oh, you have so many done and I have less. Yeah. It, depends, it actually depends on the satisfaction because you could get a stipulation and one person's like, oh, I didn't get it. Yeah. That doesn't benefit me. Right. So and really, that's not really a, a win-win situation. Right. Yeah. But I do find it interesting that people, but I like your, I mean, your overarching answer, I think, is maybe mm -hmm. the best takeaway mm -hmm. is to say that if, if I'm thinking about me winning, I've lost, I lost it yeah. minute one mm -hmm. because that's not why we're there as a mediator, yeah. right? It's all about them. Um, and so that's, that's an interesting thing. I, um, I think over time I get more and more comfortable with the notion that if anyone's operating in the upper 90s or 100% in mediation, they probably aren't good at mediation in the sense that they, they aren't working anymore with real people. Because when you say some of them need to not be mediated, like based on disagreeable uh, perspectives or the parts of the law or... I, when yes, you say the interpretation of the law, because I'm not interpreting the law. Right. I'm just helping them from what I know, what they're giving me. Right. But a judge will help, will know the background of, right. of what needs to be done and what's legal and not legal. Right. And I find, uh -huh. you know, that that I feel like some mediators don't. You feel like some mediators will um, suggest that mediation is the catch-all for everything. Yes. It's it's not. And what I kind of hear you saying is like we have a similar perspective, which is there are some matters that the judge needs to be involved in. Mm -hmm. Or I just find that people are disagreeable. I mean, wouldn't you say that is part of it, too? It's like there, it's having a 100 percent success rate as a mediator would be an impossible statistic, given mm -hmm. that we're dealing with real people. Yeah, because I had a uh, I had a case, too, where it was about um who owned the dog in small claims. Oh. Who gets to keep the dog? Really? Yes. Wait, was it a dollar amount? No, no, it was like who gets to keep the dog, like literally. Like that, dog custody. Yes, the custody. Okay. And so I was talking all the mediation, and they told me, "Oh no, you're not, you're not going to tell us who actually gets to keep the dog, because we need to know, for, we need to hear it from the judge, and he's going to say who, it's final. It's not like we're not going to have an agreement where oh I keep it for one week or another. Oh. Who get who just want who gets to keep the dog? Okay. Permanently. So they didn't want a, uh, and you could have really facilitated that, right? I had like uh -huh. a custody agreement for the pet. Yeah. Um, did you go watch that one play out in court? No, I had to do another case after, so oh. I didn't get to watch it. That would have been very interesting. I'm so to curious. See. Yeah, like what got yeah. what gets you the dog? Like that's, I don't yeah. know if it's like if you originally pay for the dog or how much love you have for the dog or resources from what to I support was in, the dog. From what I was understanding, from what they were telling me, is like who verbally said you could keep the dog, mm. or. She said I could keep the dog, but now she wants it back. And so they had like a bunch hmm. of text messages and like, we're going to show him this. We have this. This is former romantic partners, probably, right? No, mother, daughter. Oh, mother, daughter. Oh. <laughs> and we see those cases. Um, this is something that I think a lot of people don't realize yeah. is how often we have relatives in, in court. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Don't do business <laughs> with your family. Because <laughs> they, they take back all like... They bring back stuff that happened like five years ago, and mm. then they add it on. They just right. keep adding on if something right. went wrong. And when it's like people you don't really know or have a personal background, they're just looking at the facts. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's, yeah, kind of adds to the emotional component, mm -hmm. like fiercely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So do you have a philosophy of mediation? Um, if so, how does it show up on in your mediation? Uh, well, trust, trust your instincts. That's basically what it is because if you can't trust yourself, you're not gonna, then the people are not gonna trust you. Mm -hmm. The parties are gonna not be guided properly. Okay. So if I don't, if I don't believe I could do this or that I trust my skills, right. it's not gonna go anywhere. Mm -hmm. that's what I'm... So you gotta trust yourself and your skills. So that's just cannonball into the, the swimming pool then. Yeah, you just have you to. You have the skills and mm -hmm. you just say, we're do going. It. Do it. Okay, all right. Um, what do you think is the hardest uh, part of mediation to learn? And I, say, and I ask you this as a, a practitioner, not as uh, someone reading a book. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you're in court, what would you say is the hardest thing to learn? The hardest thing to learn is to hand, for them to handle their emotions correctly. That's the hardest thing because once they calm down, they more, they'll look more at the facts. Okay. And just as like it hurt me instead of saying, oh, it hurt me. This is how it affected I don't know, my wallet or it affected, uh, <laughs> you know, the, re <laughs> the relationship. <laughs> yeah, because if they're crying because, oh, they can't afford it, yeah. I feel like I let, like, let, give them the tissue and tell them to breathe and say, okay, yeah. now that, you know, your emotions came out, how can you see um, it affecting your future mm -hmm. money-wise? Mm -hmm. And then that's then what they start thinking. Oh, oh, I would like a payment plan. Mm-hmm. And then so you're saying it gives the emotional gives them clarity? Yes, that's what I've seen most of the time. Hmm. And if they don't get that clarity, the mediation just stops. Hmm. And they go back to court. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So the hardest part is to understand, I guess it kind of goes again to your perspective about the, the emotions as a step mm -hmm. to, toward that success. Yeah. And once you figure that out, you will ask the right questions. So either you know you need to clarify or you need to go back. Mm -hmm. to another step to see, um, to figure out what was missed or not. Right, which mm -hmm. is so hard as a mediator yeah. sometimes. I'm, I'm sure you've had regret <laughs> where you're like, oh yeah. no, back into storytelling. Yeah. Somehow we landed <laughs> back there. Uh, I find that in civil more often, don't you? Yes, especially when they're, um, oh yeah, I didn't do that or it happened after the fact of this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I, I'm not judging you. I, I just need you to tell me the facts. So. Mm -hmm we can get this and both of you are happy. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked about asking questions. I know that one of your other roles is to work with children. Mm -hmm. um, how has your training as a mediator affected your work in the public schools? It's public, right? Yes. Public. Yeah. It's helped me a lot, especially with the younger kids, the five, the five-year-olds and the six-year-olds, where I have to ask the question sometimes five times in different ways. And then they're like, oh, 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 so what just happened, not what happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then with the older kids, I could, I could um, use bigger words, like, how do you interpret this? What are the actions? Yeah, right. And then instead of like, oh, how did that make you feel with the younger ones? Right. So would you say then the skill advantage is the ability to adjust your question asking to the audience? Is yes. That... Okay. Because, um, you know, the, the younger ones, they're like, oh, he hit me. And I have to ask, well, were you both running? And mm -hmm. more clarification well, with the older ones, it's okay. They have more background to it. We're like, this has been a constant bother. This mm -hmm. person has been teasing me. Right. And so you get, you can go back so much and then um, they'll tell you more information. Mm -hmm. And then they're more vocal about what they want done, the older mm. kids. Okay. They're like, I want an apology letter or I want them <laughs> to stay away from me. Right. So, and, yeah. That's good to yes. help them figure out uh -huh. clarification about what they want. Mm -hmm. um, that we find adults don't know what they want no. sometimes. Sometimes they just want to be right. Yes, which we see that mm -hmm. a lot in, I'd say, both all the courts, mm -hmm. really. All of them. Right? Yeah, maybe all. Um, so you have done a little bit of work in restorative justice. Um, so tell me about how that relates to mediation. What do you see as the crossover? What are your thoughts about that? I think... RJ is more like a caucus because you talk to them individually until you do the mediation. Mm -hmm. So then you just gather up the information and then you tell the other person, mm -hmm. okay, this is what I was told. Do you agree or is there like some different discrepancies? Mm -hmm. And then, that, then you go on from there and if they agree on what's going on, like the basic story that happened, mm -hmm. then I'm like, okay, I want to do mediation or not. 
And um, the, it's sometimes hard for the kids to understand what mediation is because yeah, they're like, yeah. oh, it's a contract, okay? And, then, and it's like, yes, you're signing your name, so this means you have to follow what's, what's, what you um, agree to. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, then you're going to have repercussions. Right. And then they're like, oh, but what if I change my mind? You can't change your mind. <laughs> so that's just like yeah. adults. Yeah, right? but it's it, for them. I think it's a little bit harder, just because they're allowed to change their mind. I guess because they're younger and they're like, mm. oh, oh, but just today because I feel sad, and then the next day I feel, you know, angry. God, I feel like adults do the same <laughs> exact thing, don't you? They they do, <laughs> but I feel like the adults they know they already know what it is. Yeah. And they're just trying to manipulate whatever's going on. Where yeah. kids were, are really trying to understand why they can't do things, why they mm. can't change their mind. Okay. So then um, it's sort of like unfamiliar mm-hmm. with having an agreement, a formal agreement. Yeah. Like, what does that mean in this world? Uh-huh. What are your thoughts about putting more mediation programs in the, in the public schools? I think it will be very helpful. Just because the people that I, the the children that I've helped, they're like, oh, thank you, Miss Julia. You, now I know that I need to ask more questions before I come to you, so I know what to tell you. Wow. Yeah, that's what they've told me. Wow, that's great. So I need to ask them why they're doing this to me, and um, huh. how many times they've done it, so I yeah. keep track. Yeah. So they learn to keep track instead of thinking, oh, they did that last week. They already know in their mind. They already said they did this to me in class earlier in the morning. They did it to me yesterday in the afternoon. And then they tell me how long it's been going on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I worked for many years. um, I think you know that my background Mm -hmm. uh, began really with youth mediation systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would teach these younger kids to do all those skills, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and we've seen sort of this um, integration into the school system, but um, it, it seems like the general need for communication skills generally and mediation specifically mm-hmm. um, would benefit everybody. It will, and then it'll, it'll keep them out of going to court. Or, well, court yeah. and or the, just, yeah. or, or the justice system mm-hmm. generally, which we've talked about in the yeah. RJ area, um, right, which is mainly really the RJ goal yes, is to figure out that harm that's been done and get to a place where we aren't having to, to keep redoing the cycle, right, of harm, essentially. Yeah, because some of the kids, the older ones, like the fifth graders, they'll do something again. And I'm like, you told me last week you were not going to say something mean to this person. Right. And they're like, oh, well, it's because they're being mean to me. I'm like, that's not how the world works. An yeah. eye for an eye does not work. You need to figure out why you're doing it or why the other person is doing it mm-hmm. and then come to us and we'll help you talk about it. Mm -hmm. Because if not, you're just gonna go back and forth and nothing's ever gonna be solved. This problem is just gonna continue. Right. Yeah, and many of them get into that, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, I didn't ask you this ahead of time, but um, you received an award. I was there for it. Um, A couple of, uh, what, two months ago maybe? two months ago. Two months ago, you received the Derpa Sherpa Award, Mm -hmm. um, and that is for excellence in mediation. Mm Uh, tell us about what that award is and uh, how you felt about it. So it's basically a person who just goes above and beyond in mediation and who helps and just tries to do their best. And so... And do a lot of mediations oh, too, I oh, think. Oh, yeah, a lot. A I lot. think you had to do, I don't uh, know how many, but really a lot. I, oh, yeah, I did a lot. <laughs> Which I'm glad because actually I learned a lot because yeah. every mediation is different. Yeah. And I was surprised I thought just because, oh, I did a lot of mediations, but then they, like, explained to me, like, mm-hmm. why. Yeah. And it's because I wouldn't, they told me it's because I wouldn't give up. Mm. Give up in the That's sense lovely. that I wouldn't give up in the process, that if the process stops, yeah. I didn't let myself go down, that it was my fault. Right. So I just told them it's just because it's really on them. I'm not the star of the show. A mediator's like, oh, yeah, oh, hey, <laughs> I'm the here, I'm here to help you. Right. Um, it's, you're in, the, you're in the background. You're just right. there, like telling them what to do and yeah they're the stars of the show they the, they're the yeah. stars and they don't want to be the stars mm-hmm. right yeah <laughs> um so just one last question um to wrap this up what advice would you give a new mediator and you can have multiple things if, yeah. you, if you want to give multiple pieces um it's okay to not know how to solve one particular way it's 
okay not to know everything. Take every mistake you do as a as a learn as a learning uh, way to learn and better yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if you just dwell on everything you did wrong, you're never going to move forward. You're still going to be the same, the same type of mediator you are. Because mm -hmm. the type of mediator I was when I first started is so different to I was now, to I am now. If we had videotape, what would we see? Like, what would be the big I would say, difference? oh, you, you need to follow the steps. You need to go in order. Oh, that was what you'd start with more. Yeah, I would. Okay. Yeah, I would literally go through the steps how it is in the book. Okay. And I'm like, okay. And if they were like, someone would move forward to another step, I'm like, well, I would be like, oh, they. Would, I would revert them back mm -hmm. to go back. But if they move forward, that means that they've already progressed themselves, mm -hmm. which could, you know, they progress the um, the issue so it could be solved. Right. So it's like how much work <clears throat> they've done. It, that's more intuitive now. Yes after all these mediations that you've done. Yeah. Okay, other, other advice you'd give? Just because you get a stipulation <laughs> doesn't mean you won or yeah. they've won. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people get caught up in, oh, I got nine out of 10 cases today. I'm doing yeah. amazing. Yeah. I'm like, did it, did it really help them at the end? Yeah. Yeah. Which is a great guiding question. It's mm -hmm. something I think about a lot, um, especially when I'm writing those agreements. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, could you, could you go home and know what to do and feel good about it, mm -hmm. like based on this? Like, would you know when to pay, where to pay it? Mm -hmm. And would this like take your problem at least to a place where it's manageable? I can't, mm -hmm. I can't erase it, right? Yeah. But I can try to make it yeah. Help not, them. As, yeah. not as <laughs> bad. <laughs> Um, we were talking on the way in here about uh, this week I was teaching the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation mm -hmm. in my conflict class. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about forgiveness, which is canceling the debt the person mm -hmm. owes you. Um, and then how distinctively different that is from reconciling, mm -hmm. which is restoring the relationship, yeah. right? And so um, you and I were talking about mediation related to that. Um, what do you think about reconciling versus like canceling the debt? Like what do you think is achievable in mediation? Well, it depends on how the process goes, because I feel like if you just end up with um, the stipulation, to, that can't, that's not reconciliation. That's just like mm -hmm. solving this problem, but not their relationship itself. And mm -hmm. the reconciliation, they're going to know if they come into a problem similar to it. Mm -hmm. They will know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And then the other way, oh, they just know how to deal with this one, not the right. rest of their problems. Right. And sometimes I feel like mediators try to um, do both. I, mm -hmm. Would you say you've seen that where people yeah. kind of believe we're going to get the relationship solved too, which mm -hmm. can happen. I mean, I've certainly seen it in mm -hmm. my own mediations, but also wouldn't you say sometimes that maybe one can happen, but not the other? Yes. Uh, most of the time what I've seen is just um, the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Most of the time. Where they say this particular setting, okay. we're going to sell, settle it this way. Mm -hmm. And then what about the reconciliation? Just In the reconciliation, sometimes you see it because then they're really happy and they're hugging each other and you're like, whoa, you came in like hating each other. Right. And now you're like, oh yeah, well, I'll see you next week. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's when I can tell that the reconciliation happened. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, this is done. Let's go. I had, I can't remember if I mentioned it on the show before, mm -hmm. but I had a, a, a automobile case one time and they were really mad at each other at the beginning. And mm -hmm. after we got the stipulation, I went to go write it up in a different office. And mm -hmm. I came back, and they were um, following each other on Instagram, and they were friends on Facebook, and they were joking around. And I had to, I said, hey, so we want to talk about the rest of the mediation and get the signed agreement. And it was like I was interrupting old friends. <laughs> and I, it was so funny to me because I thought, boy, the two of you mm -hmm. were about to, I mean, they were about to punch each other. At the beginning, like I was thinking about that as a mediator. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, am I going to get into a physical altercation thing mm -hmm. between these gentlemen? And then we ended up at that, which is, um, but I would say it's more, more rare. Would, yes. Would you say that? Yeah. I think it really is. Yeah. Because usually they're just focused on the issue and not the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And you need to look at the whole picture if you want to go to the reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing that I would add to when we talk about the serious cases in civil, mm -hmm. um, in civil harassment court, um, sometimes, and this is not my opinion, you know, my opinion doesn't matter, but mm -hmm. I have seen cases where reconciliation would be maybe dangerous, right? To mm -hmm. restore the relationship would be possibly a very bad idea for maybe both parties. It's more about like, what's your current like set of behaviors that need to change, but 
getting back to like a back to your romantic mm -hmm. relationship or back to your friendship might mm -hmm. be a bad thing. I don't know. Do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, most of the time when I when I see for that how you're saying, sometimes they just need to know how to act like a polite human being. <laughs> you, just, you just they just need to know okay you know be courteous if you see them you know don't give them don't roll your eyes don't, don't make a gesture, gesture uh -huh, inappropriate gestures or anything we write a lot of that mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. you can see yeah. we write a lot of that yeah. no no remarks mm -hmm. or inappropriate gesturing mm -hmm. um, and speak with courtesy and respect exactly. yeah that's uh that's good well, thank you so much for being here today on the show. Um, great to hear from you, and uh, would love to have you back if you'll come some other time. Um, have a great day. Okay, so we have seen um, some great answers from Julia in terms of practitioner uh, tips that we could use as we develop our mediation skills. Um, and I want to just kind of end the show today by talking about this bias that I've I've previously spoken about, and that is that I think we have to marry the notion of theory and practice together in order to be effective at mediation. And so as we kind of think about this process, um, really strongly consider that the book knowledge is very, very good, uh, but the experience is also very crucial. And as we put those two together, then we can serve other people, which is something, of course, that we've talked about today. So. Um, Anyway, thank you again, Julia, for coming on the show, and thank you for everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.